to Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord. But let me first say farewell to those at home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow is fit for the kingdom of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. There's a TV show that we often will watch in our house, and it's on HGTV, and the name of the show is Hometown. And some of you may be very familiar with that show. Hometown is based in Laurel, Mississippi. There's a couple that lives in Laurel, Mississippi, and uh, their names are Ben and Aaron. And they go around from house to house, and they go into old houses in Laurel, Mississippi, and they renovate them. And typically, at the beginning of the show, you get to see kind of the history of this house, what it looks like now, who was the last person to live in it, and what's the history of that house in the town of Laurel, Mississippi. But then, they take this potential buyer, and this potential buyer walks in, and and Aaron has this computer, and, and she begins to show this potential buyer, look, here's what this house could be. If you take these walls out over here and, and move them, we can make this kitchen so much bigger. If we put these cabinets in that are this color, it'll give you more space. If we go into this room and we vault this ceiling, it's going to have an amazing effect on this house. And then this wall that separates the kitchen and the den, we would eliminate that wall. And all of this is actually showing up on the computer for the person to see, and then, of course, for us to see who are watching the show. And the husband, Ben, is walking along the whole time, and then at the end, Ben comes, and he says, and you can have all of this for $40,000. He is the one that comes along and says, this is the cost of everything that's going to that's gonna be done in this house. It's going to look like this, which is going to be awesome. It's going to look pretty and new and renovated. And here's the cost. The passage that we just read, Jesus has, is having three separate conversations with three separate individuals. And the thing is, is they've seen Jesus. They know who he is. They've heard about what he's done. They've seen the enthusiasm of the crowds. And now they want to be a part of the action. They want to follow Jesus. But Jesus, actually knowing their hearts, takes time in his responses to help them understand both the implications of their words and also what the life of a follower of Jesus really looks like. And so if you and I want to be wholehearted followers of Jesus Christ, we have to understand what does it mean to follow Christ? What does it mean to be one of his disciples? And so in this text, we're going to see three things that help us understand that question. What does it mean to follow Jesus Christ. What does this text say about that? And the first thing that we have to understand about what it means to follow Jesus Christ is we have to understand the reality of true discipleship. What does the life of a disciple of Jesus really look like? The second thing is we must base our lives and our decisions upon the authority of the word of God. And thirdly, we must fully devote ourselves to him. So what does it mean to follow Jesus Christ? If you and I want to say, I will follow you, what does that mean for us? Well, the first thing is we have to understand the reality of true discipleship. 
We have to understand what does the life of a disciple of Jesus Christ look like. So again, in verses 57 and 58, James and John and, and Jesus are walking along the road. And this man comes up to Jesus and says, I will follow you wherever you go. Now, of course, Jesus is, is making his way towards Jerusalem. His face is set towards Jerusalem, his mission in Jerusalem. And that mission for Jesus Christ is going to involve a, a mission of complete suffering and eventually death. Intense suffering, pain, betrayal, being made fun of, being spit upon, that is the mission that Jesus Christ is going on, and the cross is where he's headed. Now we know from Matthew 8 that this scribe, that this person is actually a scribe. And the scribe is saying, I want to follow Jesus. I want to join with you and be one of your disciples is what that verb actually means. I want to join up with you and be one of your disciples. And so we know from the Old Testament that a scribe is actually one who understands the law, inter interprets the law. And so the scribe is, is living a life where he is honored and he is respected for the knowledge he has and the position he holds. And so what he's saying is I want to join up with you as a disciple. And Jesus is about to help him understand, okay, well, here's the way life is going to look. This is the life you're used to, but this is the way that life will be as one of my disciples. And he responds, Jesus responds by saying, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus is helping this man understand this is what the life of a disciple of Jesus Christ looks like. It is a life that will lead to suffering. It is a life where your purpose and your plan is defined not by you, but by Christ. But how do we know that it will involve a life of suffering? How do we know this? Well, if you look at Jesus' response, it says this. It says, the Son of Man. He refers to himself as the Son of Man. Son of Man is actually his favored way of referring to himself. He is... He is recorded as referring to himself as the Son of Man over 80 times in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. And even in Luke 9.22, he says, The Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected, be killed, be raised again on the third day. In Matthew's account of this same story, in Matthew 8.20, he is referred to as the Son of Man. In John 1.51, he's referred to as the Son of Man. And then in Daniel 7.13, again, he is being called the Son of Man in the Old Testament. Why does this matter? Why is this important for us today? Because in that designation as the Son of Man is wrapped up the identity, the purpose, and the plan of who Jesus is and why he even came. He is the humble servant who came to save sinners. That's Matthew 1. Martin talked about how he's the suffering servant, as we see that in Isaiah 53, whose atoning death and resurrection will redeem his people. He's the son of God who became flesh in John 1, 1 through, 4, 1 through 14. And again, in Daniel 7, 13, he is the glorious king and judge who will return to establish God's kingdom on earth. When that scribe says, I will follow you wherever you go, he is saying, I want my life to be defined by yours. I want my purpose and my plan to be defined by the purpose and plan that you have for me. 
Not what my parents have for me, not what my grandparents have for me, not what anyone else has for me, but my purpose and plan will be defined by the Christ that I follow. But there's more to it. He responds, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He said, foxes have holds and birds of the nests, birds of the air have nests. He's saying in that moment, look, the, the animals that I created, they have a place to return to. They have a home. At the end of the day, when they're worn out and tired, they have a place to go to. Jesus is one who goes from village to village, relying on the kindness of others and the provision of God. So not only do we need to understand that, a re that the reality of a life of someone who follows Jesus is being defined by his purpose and his plan, the life of a follower of Jesus involves a life of faith. It is a life defined by faith, where the comforts and the luxuries of this life are secondary and a wholehearted following of Jesus Christ and our relationship with him is primary. It's about God's purpose, God's plan, and God's provision. When Dylan and I were raising our children, we have four daughters and we were raising them. Each one of them went to public school. That was what we chose at the time, but we always knew that, that the school that we chose was a year-to-year -year decision. We always knew that. And at the end of uh, our first daughter's ninth grade year, towards the end of it, she came to us and she said, my classes have about 35 to 40 people in each, in, in each class. And they are, there, there's so many people in those classes that I cannot, I, I, I can't focus. There's so much going on. The teachers can't control the room and tons of the kids are not interested in learning and I'm messing up and I'm not doing as well as I know I can do. Would you let me go to this other school? And this other school was one of the private schools in Memphis. And so we began to research a little bit about the school, to go online and, and see who are the teachers, what are they teaching, which grade, you know, which teachers might she have. And, and then we saw the cost of the, the tuition, and, and I was floored because I was like, there's no way, we can't afford that. And then we started to pray about it. And slowly, we began the process of going through the, the applications. And we walked through the application process, and we, and we prayed, Lord, if this is your will, we need you to just keep the door open and not shut it. And so we went through the application process and that went really smoothly. And then we found out during the application process that, that there's scholarship available to some families if they need them. And so we went through the scholarship process to apply. And as we did that, we began to pray, Lord, this is what we know that, that we can handle. We crunched the numbers, we looked at our bills, and, and we realized this is the amount of money that we can pay per month. But it was so far apart from, from the cost of tuition. And so we began to pray that God would provide enough scholarship to meet this monthly amount. And two months went by and we got a letter in the mail that said, you have been approved for scholarship money. And the monthly amount that we were approved for, the amount of scholarship that we got and the difference between what we had to pay was within pennies of what we had to pray, of what we prayed for that we could afford. A life of following Jesus, of being one of his disciples involves understanding the reality of what that life looks like. And it does, it is a life of being defined by his purpose and his plan, and it is a life of faith, trusting him each moment of every day. We trusted God each year as she came close to senior year that he would provide the money we need, and he did each 
and every year. But if you and I are going to be followers of Jesus, we, we must understand the reality of what life looks like, but we also must understand that we base our lives and our decisions upon the authority of the Word of God. That's number two. We base our lives and our decisions upon the authority of the Word of God. This second conversation, Jesus encounters a second man as they're walking along, and Jesus is actually the one who walks up to this man and says, follow me. And I have to park there for a minute before we get to his response, because this is so important. Jesus is the one who is actually initiating the conversation. He is the one speaking to this man, saying, follow me. And I love the verses in Deuteronomy 7, verses 7 through 8. Because there's nothing in this man that warrants Jesus coming to him and inviting him into a relationship. There's nothing in that man that warrants that. In Deuteronomy 7, verses 7 through 8, God is speaking of the Israelites and he says these words. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people as, to be a people as his treasured possession. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping an oath that he swore to your fathers. It is because of God's love that he says to any one of us, follow me. And realize what he's saying. He says the word follow, the verb follow, but then he says me. He doesn't say follow your heart. He doesn't say follow your feelings. He doesn't say follow what's popular. He says follow me. He is inviting this man into a relationship first. He invites him into a relationship before he even says go and do something. He invites him into a relationship. How does Jesus respond? Or how's the man respond? The man actually responds to Jesus by saying these words, let me first go and bury my father. Now, this is, in, this is important for us to look at because what's happening here is that the burial of a loved one under Jewish tradition is normally ranked even higher than attending religious services. The burial of a loved one is more important. The responsibilities and the obligations that this man has are, are more important right now. This man is saying, let me first take care of my responsibilities and my obligations before committing fully to you. Jesus responds by saying, let the dead bury their own dead. Now, on the surface, that seems very harsh. Let the dead bury their own dead. But what Jesus is not doing, he's not, he's not saying to this man, dishonor your father. Because, see, that would go against the fifth commandment. But what he is doing is he's using language that expresses so holy of a calling and so high of a calling that the, that the importance and the duty and the, and the responsibility to go and do this would pale in comparison to the words, follow me. And so Jesus is basically saying, look, don't go and bury your father. Go and be about the business of the Father. Go and proclaim that the kingdom of God has come in the person of Jesus. And so he's at a crossroads in this ministry. He's at a crossroads where he is looking at, do I obey the words of Jesus or do I obey the responsibilities, the duties, and everything that is going on around me? Do I look to the busyness and the duties and the responsibilities do I, that I have or do I pay attention to what Jesus wants me to do. And the important thing here is that this is exactly where Satan wants us to live. 
He wants us to live in this crossroads where we are paying attention to the responsibilities, the duties, the obligations, and the busyness of life and our schedules more than we do the Word of God. He wants us to be so consumed with those things that we almost ignore or forget God. I won't read the whole quote because I know that we're, we're running out of time, but there's a book called The Screwtape Letters by C.S. Lewis. And it's a religious satire where it, the whole book is about Satan and his demons and what they can do to sidetrack the faith of followers of Christ. And just a few things I'll read is this. This is what he says. Invent schemes to occupy their mind. Entice them to work six to seven days a week and 10 to, t- 10 to 12 hours a day to keep them from spending time with their kids. Overstimulate their minds so it crowds out the still small voice of God. The whole point is to distract us from the call of God on our lives by the things that we have in our schedules, the busyness, the obligations, the responsibilities, the duties, crowds that out. Is Christ calling you to follow him? Are you hearing that still, small voice of God to leave a life of self-promotion and self-exaltation to follow the one true God? Because a life of a, of a disciple of Jesus Christ, the life of a follower of Jesus Christ, there, we, we must understand the reality of what that looks like. We obey the word of God. And lastly, we must be fully devoted to him. We must be fully devoted to him. In this last conversation, you have someone who steps forward and says, I will follow you. He says, I will follow you. But let me first go and say goodbye to my family. Let me first go and say to my family, and one commentator says that, that just as one who plows must look before him and devote his full attention to his work, so he who decides to be a, Christ, a follower of Christ should never allow other matters to distract him. Complete devotion and unconditional faithfulness is required for the follower of Christ. This man is saying to Jesus, hey, I will follow you, but it's going to be on my terms and in my timing. It's on my terms and it's on my timing. He has completely reversed the relationship between a follower of Christ and a disciple. He is trying to dictate to Christ, this is when I will do this. We must be fully devoted to Christ, complete devotion. And here's the thing, I have one last thing in one story, so please stay with me in this. Jesus is not telling us to do anything he hasn't already done. See, when he died on the cross, he forsook all the relationships he had on earth. His mother, his father, his siblings, his friends. But he experienced the ultimate rejection when on that cross he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in that moment, he lost the father's favor. He lost the father's fellowship and he experienced the father turning his face away and he did that for one reason so that you and I would fully devote ourselves to him and answer the call to follow Christ and be one of his disciples I'm going to close with this story there's a there's a missionary also in Jordan her name is Aileen Coleman and she is in her 90s She lives in Mafrak, Jordan. She works with Bedouin people. And back decades ago when she went into uh, missionary service, she had her nursing degree and she went to help the sick. To help the sick that were in Mafrak, Germany. And what she did was she went there and she built relationships with the people as she provided health care so that she could share her faith in Jesus Christ. And then when she got there, as she did this, she quickly learned that she was in a male-dominant society. She quickly learned that the first thing that she was going to have to do was learn how to adapt to a new culture, shed the Western values that she had learned, and embrace a new life, a new identity, and a new culture that involved helping the sick 
and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ through building relationships. You see, when she left Australia where she was born, she left relationships. When she went to Mafrak, Jordan, she took on a new identity. She called herself a Bedouin. She took on the purpose and the plan that Christ had for her regardless of everything else. Because a life of complete devotion means this. It means that we love everything less than Christ. Even our family. Even our children. Even our grandchildren. Even our spouse. That's what Luke 14 says. That's what Jesus says in Luke 14. He is the first love. A life of complete devotion to him means he is our first love. And that is the life that Aileen Coleman chose to live. She has taken on the purpose and the plan of Christ for her life. So if we want to understand what it means to follow Jesus, we do understand that we, we have to understand what life looks like. We have to understand that it's putting God's word first over everything else, and it is putting him first over every other relationship. Complete devotion to him. So two questions and then I'll pray. What purpose or plan or relationship are you placing above Christ's invitation to you to follow him? If you are a follower of Christ, is there something that you are constantly looking back to to fill the void in your heart that can only be filled with a relationship with Jesus Christ? My prayer today is if you are hearing that still, small voice of God, you will not delay. You will not say, it's on my terms and my timing. You will say, I will follow. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you so much that you sent your son to die for us. Help us respond to the call that you have on our lives. Help us not to delay. Help us not to make excuses, but to follow you with our whole hearts. God, give us, give us the wisdom to respond today. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org give to give.